Thanks very much, Steve, as uh, Gloria joins me on the podium. Um, this presentation is really just a kind of an overview for all of you of some of the new things that we're doing at BCHS in terms of analgesia. Now, my title is Director of Clinical and Professional Practice for the province, and it's a fairly new role that uh, John Talon created uh, with a vision of paramedics helping lead paramedic practice. So I'm a paramedic by background, and I have three paramedic practice leaders for all here, John Deacon, Ole Olson, who you met, and uh, Leon Baranowski in the front. And their whole role for existing in, in BCHS is to help us drive paramedicine forward in terms of the clinical practice we do, the research that we do, the professionalism we aspire to. And part of this presentation is because of the work of this team. So the team's only been together fully since about August. And uh, in August, and from August until kind of into the fall, we went all over the province to talk to paramedics about what they saw in terms of gaps in their practice. What did they think they needed in terms of being able to provide better, safer patient care? And what we heard most commonly, in fact, overwhelmingly, was paramedics at the ACP and PCP level felt that their ability to control patients' pain was not meeting their needs. Not meeting their needs and certainly not meeting the paramedic or the patient's needs. So we took that back and uh, Gloria and I are gonna tell you about some of the things that we did to work towards improving this. So, uh, we have no disclosures except neither Gloria and I think the patients should have pain and the World Health Organization agrees. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, some regulation in British Columbia that guides what we can do in terms of clinical practice. Uh, we're we'll talking about methoxyfluorine or penthrox, which is pretty new to the Canadian uh, landscape. Uh, ketamine for PCPs and ACPs, as well as uh, some other initiatives with uh, a move to fentanyl and acetaminophen and ibuprofen on the, on the uh, vehicles. So in British Columbia, we actually have, we don't have self-regulation, we don't have a paramedic college, we have the Emergency Medical Assistance Licensing Board, which I find completely derogatory to call paramedics emergency medical assistance, but nonetheless, this is my soapbox I'll stamp off right now. Um, but we do have our scope of practice that is, in, in fact, quite archaically written into the regulation, which is written into provincial law. So if we want to make changes to regulation, even to a classification of medication that we're adding to practice, it requires a ministerial um, order or a change in the regulation. So it's, it's a long process. So within British Columbia, what we're trying to work within is ACPs are allowed to give narcotics. Good, we've got some range there. And uh, they can also give sedatives. So again, we've got some range and we can use some interpretation in, in which drugs fit into these classifications. Uh, PCPs, though, have to have a Schedule II endorsement to be able to give analgesia, which is defined only as analgesia, and they can give it by oral, sublingual, or inhaled. Now, we kind of interpreted that inhaled kind of meant intranasal as well. Uh, you might disagree. Uh, but we also had some board approval to allow PCPs in British Columbia to use ketamine, which uh, you'll hear more about later on this afternoon. So I'm going to get Gloria to speak about methoxyfluorine. Um, so with regards to methoxyfluorine, and Joe's a little taller than me, so I'm just this. Um, so with regards to methoxyfluorine, it is an anesthetic gas. At low doses, it does have analgesic properties. How it works, we don't really know. It does act on some. It does act upon some uh, GABA glutamate and glycine, but how it actually provides analgesia, not really sure of the mechanism of action. It is approved in Health Canada back in April of last year for treatment of moderate to severe pain associated with trauma or for interventional uh, medical procedures. In terms of the patient population, it is only for adult patients in use in Canada. So pediatric patients is defined by um, patients less than 18 years old is excluded from use. Same for pregnant patients or patients who are peritonal. Um, other issues and or contraindications officially by the drug manufacturer is that it should not be used for any patient with any changes or alterations in their level of consciousness, whether that's due to injury, alcohol, drugs, um, or any of the other things that can impact level of consciousness. It also is a contraindication for patients with renal failure to use or if they've ever developed liver toxicities or <laughs> previous methoxyfluorine exposure, the patients should not be using methoxyfluorine. In terms of what we know for efficacy in a pre-hospital setting, we actually don't have a lot of data. We know that methoxyfluorine is an analgesic agent, but how it does in compare to other agents in the pre-hospital setting, we don't really know. There was one retrospective study, observational, that looked at methoxyfluorine versus ibuprofen and tranexyl fentanyl. Um, while they both provide, or while they all provided analgesic for patients pre-hospital, it seemed like um, the opioids actually did a little bit better in the pre-hospital setting. It has also been studied in an emergency department setting, and in that setting, um, there was no active comparator group, but we do not know that for moderate to severe trauma pain, it is an effective agent, but again, no active comparators. 
most commonly um, with oxyfluorine from the studies that we do have generally pretty well tolerated. Um, most common side effects being a little bit is dizziness, nausea, but paresthesias, and very, very rarely will it cause bradycardia or hypertension. Thank you. So what we did is we took methoxyfluorine and we said we know that it, it works. We don't have a lot of evidence to support how it works compared to other agents. Uh, but it's been given millions of times in Australia. I worked there for seven years and used it in the field. And it's been used there since the 1970s. So we thought maybe it could, maybe it could have a benefit to patients here in British Columbia. So what we did is we found a small pot of money to do a little bit of a proof of concept trial to see what paramedics thought of methoxyfluorine in the field. And then we would also look at the clinical uh, outcomes from the patient care records. So we identified 10 stations. This is a project that was uh, led by Holly Olson we met this morning. And uh, coincidentally, the 10 stations are PCP stations who are often close to ski hills. And we implemented this in uh, December through to March. And we had about 200 doses that we distributed to the field and asked paramedics to use it as they would normally uh, administer analgesia uh, within the indications and contraindications that Gloria shared. And then fill out just a simple five question survey that was done by SurveyMonkey. Uh, we're early on in the analysis, but what we found um, it was just given three mil doses, which is a standard dose and occasionally a repeat dose if it was a long transport. What we found is that 100% of the patient or the paramedics found that the education we provided, which was less than an hour of face to face education, was sufficient to make them feel competent and, and comfortable getting the medication. We found 97.5 said it was easy to administer. They agreed or strongly agreed that it was easy to administer in the field. It's very, very simple, a lot less equipment than nitrous oxide. You don't have to draw anything up and it's no injections. We found that uh, they strongly agreed that the materials we provided, which was our handbook app, which you can download, uh, which had the information in it, as well as the information that our clinical educators provided, met their needs in terms of education. What we were interested though, or sorry, the last one was that they 100% of them thought that we should add it to their practice. So after giving it, our end was about 52. 100% of them thought that we should add this to the practice, that it was something that was valuable for paramedics. Uh, but 10% of them thought that it wasn't effective for that patient. And we have to unpack this more by looking at the patient care records to see why. Was it because the patient couldn't self-administer it or, or did they have to move to a different agent or something? So some early indications say that this is something we should consider for practice. Oh, sorry. So in terms of next steps, um, as Joe mentioned, we're gonna complete the reflection and the survey just to see um, how the oxyfluorine did in the field, address some of those concerns that paramedics had. For potentially do a cost analysis, we know that per dose is about roughly $45 per dose. Um, and if we were to roll this out province-wide, it'd be about $2 million? $2 million province-wide per year. So it is quite a bit of a cost. Um, and because we can't use it for pregnant patients or pediatrics, there might still potentially be a need for nitrous oxide, which is our current um, inhaled anesthetic gas or analgesia pre-hospital. Um, and the other things that we were thinking of doing is potentially comparing the data that we do have for methoxyfluorine and comparing that to our data that we have for intranasal ketamine, which Joe will talk a little bit about later, and also compare that to nitrous oxide and see how that goes. We also do have to decide as an organization whether there is a role for methoxyfluorine if in future states um, the plan is for PCPs to have access to intranasal opioids. So now on to ketamine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time speaking about ketamine because Gary Andafad was here to speak about our ketamine trial that was used for PCP, so that's a little bit later today. So I'm not going to steal this thunder. But what we did do is uh, we identified an opportunity to use ketamine for our PCP flight crews in two bases. And the reason why is because we couldn't use Intanox in aircraft, nitrous oxide, and we couldn't use the methoxyfluorine in aircraft, so intranasal ketamine seemed to make sense. And as I reported at the beginning, PCPs in BC aren't really able to give narcotics. So we were limited to, this, to the medications that we could use, and based on what Gary's gonna tell you today, the effectiveness of the uh, PCP trial that we use, we move forward with implementing it. So Steve Wheeler and Rob Schlamp implemented it in two stations, uh, which is Prince Rupert and uh, Fort St. John, which is where PCPs uh, fly in our aircraft. Well, we've been collecting all the data, and uh, what we found is that so far, the effectiveness of uh, PCP-administered intranasal ketamine has been very, very strong. Um, we've had 43 uses in uh, Prince Rupert and 10 uses in Fort St. John, uh, with no serious adverse effects and a few minor, um, a few minor reactions. So dry mouth, uh, feeling that they're a little bit odd, spaced out, uh, and very, very sort of insignificant sort of uh, adverse effects. Uh, but the, the overwhelming feeling of the paramedics is that this is having a huge impact on reducing patients' pain in that flight environment. Now, 
Uh, we are still going to evaluate the PCP uh, intranasal for, or intranasal for the PCPs as we go forward. We don't have any plans to implement it further beyond our flight uh, crews at this time. We do have a number of logistical challenges. The Foxy Flurry is pretty easy because it's not controlled, but ketamine, of course, is. So we'd have to move biometric safes into all of our PCP stations. It's big cultural shifts on PCPs counting drugs, um, counting wastage, signing things off. So this is a big logistical change, a big cost change. So we are investigating this very closely to see how, how this might work in the future in terms of a uh, bigger rollout of uh, intranasal PC or ketamine for PCPs. Um, as Gloria said, nitrous oxide is fairly uh, expensive, or inexpensive in terms of 30 to 35 dollars per patient. Methoxyfluorine is substantially more expensive, 45 to 55 dollars per patient. Where the nice thing about ketamine is it's very cheap, so about 12 dollars for two doses. So in terms of cost effectiveness, ketamine comes out a clear winner. Um, but we have a lot more research to do to determine where we're going to go with this. So the other thing that's changing within BCP is that over the next year we'll solely be rolling out fentanyl to replace uh, morphine for pain management in the hospital, um, except for maybe critical care paramedics in the palliative care setting. And in my discussions with health authorities to transition from morphine to fentanyl, that's generated some very interesting conversations, especially in light of the opioid crisis that we have here in Vancouver and BC, um, with fentanyl being part of um, the compound being adul uh, uh, adulterated with fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Um, but there are some benefits with fentanyl, and I think as an organization we did decide, or as the CMP group, we did decide that there are benefits for fentanyl, such as faster acting, and there is a little bit less side effects with associated with um, hypertension, um, histamine release, the itchiness, et cetera, for patients. Um, so we are deciding to go ahead with it. But B, it has raised also um, kind of shine a light on the fact that we do have internal control and targeted substances policies that we need to review. Um, and in conjunction with that, because we are a province-wide organization, there was different interpretations um, of the policies. And so currently we're working on rolling out procedures um, that will be more detailed and be subject to less interpretation so that there is more consistent and standard of care and handling of these controlled and targeted substances province-wide. The other thing that we will be doing is adding ibuprofen and acetaminophen into the practice um, guidelines for pain management pre-hospital. And there is some ed evidence for using acetaminophen and ibuprofen in the pre-hospital setting for pain, pain management in military data. Um, I, acetaminophen and ibuprofen are indicated for mild pain. We're hoping that it will be an adjective therapy to opioids or opioid sparing. In the last uh, slides on palliative care, uh, we had a million dollars that was given to us or granted to us by the federal government to investigate ways that paramedics can improve our care for end-of-life patients. And part of that is, of course, reducing pain and, and dealing with some of the other effects of, of end-of-life uh, of care. So we are looking at hydromorphone, potentially morphine, uh, but by various routes, uh, whereas pampaloperidol and ibuprofen and acetaminophen for end-of-life patients' palliative care. So again, more information to come on this as we go forward. So that's just a quick overview of things that we're investigating. We're only six months into this journey of finding better ways to equip our paramedics to treat patients in British Columbia. A lot more work needs to be done, a lot more research needs to be done. We hope that we can publish some of our quality assurance uh, uh, data that we can get it out into the public forum so that, that all of you can have access to it and then take it to the, even the next level. And uh, we'd like to ask the opportunity to uh, answer your questions and please don't ask any hard ones. <laughs>